This is the first lesson of the polynomial equations and inequalities unit. So we're going to be solving polynomial equations and look at some applications. So by the end of today, you should be able to distinguish between a polynomial function and a polynomial equation. Solve polynomial equations by factoring and finding the zeros. Uh, determine when there are no solutions to the polynomial equations and use a graph to solve polynomial equations. And the volume of a composite figure, so like this silo that you see here, uh, is an example of a polynomial function. So the silo you hear, see here, that's the uh, volume of the cylinder, and then half the volume of a sphere. So volume of a cylinder plus half the volume of a sphere at the top. If given a volume and height, however, this becomes a polynomial equation. So this is a polynomial function where the volume of the silo is a function of the radius, this, however, is a polynomial equation because it equals a constant value. In this case, 684 times pi. To solve polynomial equations, we set one side to zero, just like we did with quadratic equations, and then solve for the variable. This can also be called finding the zeros, determining the roots, or finding the intercepts. Since you're finding the values of the variable that make it equal to zero. So you can do this uh, by factoring and finding the zeros. Using the quadratic formula, if one of the factors is a quadratic that cannot be factored. And then you can also try graphing it and locating the x-intercepts on a graph. But we're gonna start with the algebraic approach, which is the first two steps of this process. So solve the above polynomial equation, representing a silo with the dimensions listed. Find all the possible values of radius in meters given that radius has to be an element of real numbers such that the radius cannot be equal to zero, but is in fact a positive number. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna restate our polynomial equation here. Okay, so I'm gonna write it up here. It is 684 times pi is equal to 15 pi r squared plus 1 half 4 over 3 pi r cubed. And so I see um, I can just uh, rewrite this again and the other thing that I'm going to do is um, I'm going to get rid of pi. I'm going to divide everything by pi because it's not really helpful and uh, it's kind of overcomplicating things here. So pi will cancel throughout this equation and I end up with 684 is equal to 15 r squared and then 1 half times 4 over 3 well that's 4 over 6 but 4 over 6 can be reduced to 2 over 3 so 2 over 3 r cubed alright now one of the issues here is that we have um, a fraction coefficient right here 2 over 3 and I don't want to work with fractions because they overly complicate things so what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply everything by 3 to clear the fraction. So I multiply 684 by 3. Well, that's 2052. I multiply 15 by 3. That's 45. And then I multiply 2 over 3 by 3. Well, that's just 2. And now we have whole number coefficients uh, in front of my variables. Just like we said, we are going to... Uh, let's just scroll back up here. Set one side equal to zero and solve for the variable. So we're going to take this side, uh, set it equal to zero, and then we have 2r cubed plus 45r squared minus 2052. All right. So effectively, we have a cubic. And um, I can't think of anything to like factor by grouping. I uh, certainly can't do that because, um, or factoring by decomposition, can't really think of anything here. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm just going to uh, use factor theorem, and I'm highlighting it up here, right? So I'm going to use factor theorem here to um, determine uh, if this is factorable, okay? So I look at 2052, and I think of all the possible x values there, well, like 1, uh, 2, uh, like uh, 3, well we can see if 2052 is divisible by 3, I'm just going to do this a little bit on the side here, 
uh, 2 plus 0 plus 5 plus 2, that's equal to 9. 9 is certainly divisible by 3, so 2052 is divisible by 3. So 3 could be a possibility, and so can 6, and maybe even 9. So um, what we're going to do is uh, you try out all the values. And uh, having tried out the values already ahead of time, I know that 1 doesn't work, and 2 doesn't work, and neither does 3. But when I insert 6 into this equation, um, 6 uh, does cause this equation to equal to 0. So that means r minus 6 is a factor. Uh, so therefore, like r minus 6 is a factor since um, when you set r equal to 6, the equation equals to 0. Right? Since when r is equal to 6, the equation equals 0. All right. So uh, now that I have r minus 6 as one of the factors, I can use uh, synthetic division. So my k value is 6, so I'll put a 6 right here, and then I'll do uh, my synthetic, set up my synthetic division here. 2, right there, 45. Note that I have no term with just r to the power of 1, so I've got to put a 0, and then I've got to put negative 2052. And if all goes well, I should end up with a remainder of 0. So I bring the 2 down. 6 times 2 is 12. And I add those two together, and I get 57. Uh, 6 times 57 is equal to 342. Add those two together, I get 342. And 342 times 6 is positive 2052. And when I add those together, I get 0, and that makes sense. So. Um, now I know this is going to be, that's, remember that's 2x squared, that's 57x, and that's going to be 342, remainder 0. So let's go back here. 0 is equal to, and remember r minus 6 is a factor. Sorry, I goofed over here. I put x's, and they really should have been r's. So 2r squared, 57r, there we go. So r minus 6, and then we have... 2 r squared plus 57 r plus 342. Okay, so 6 is definitely a possibility. Now it says um, up here, if we look at what the next step is, we can use the quadratic formula if one of the factors is a quadratic that cannot be factored. So if I look at this, well, I don't want to go through. Um, you know, I don't want to go through the measures of finding two numbers that multiply to 684, but then add to 57, okay? Um, so I think it's just easier uh, to look at, to use the quadratic formula. So what we have to think about here is, this is called the uh, zero product rule. which means that if this equation is zero, is equal to zero, then either this is equal to zero or this is equal to zero, right? Because zero times a number produces zero. So I already know what one of my r values are. Well, that means that r minus six has to be equal to zero, because as we said, zero times that quadratic would be equal to zero. So r is equal to 6, and that's a possible radius for this cylinder, or rather for this silo. Um, but the other possibility is that uh, 2r squared plus 57r plus 342 could also equal 0. And like I said, I'm not going to bother trying to factor that, and quite frankly, I'm not even sure that it is factorable. So what I'll do is I will use my quadratic formula, which says that r is equal to negative b, negative 57, plus or minus the square root of 57 squared, b squared, minus 4a2 times c, 342, all over 2a, 2 times 2. Okay, um, and then I'm just going to uh, quickly simplify that for you. I'm not going to go through all the steps. Uh, you can, I'm sure, do that uh, yourself in your calculators. And you get 57 plus or minus the square root of, if I'm not mistaken, 513 all over 4. All right. 
Um, when we go to do this, we end up with uh, two values for r. r1, which is approximately equal to uh, negative 8.6. And because I have this approximation here, well, that tells me that it wasn't factorable. r2 is approximately equal to negative 19.9, right? Okay, so I know that my radii cannot be uh, negative values. So I can immediately dismiss these two as in, uh, inadmissible solutions. And therefore my only possible value is uh, six. So um, find all possible values of the radius in meters. Therefore, the radius of the silo is six meters. Okay, so just to recap here, we had our equation, we simplified it, set it to zero, then we factored it using factor theorem, uh, and then we had one of the factors, which is, you know, either of those factors have to be equal to zero, and I found the r value for this factor, that would make it equal to zero, and then I found the two r values for this factor, that would make it equal to zero, found that they were inadmissible based on our restrictions on r, and uh, we move on. Okay, so uh, I think we so far have distinguished between a polynomial function uh, and a polynomial equation, uh, and then we have solved polynomial equations by factoring and finding the zeros. Let's continue to move over here. Okay, yet another one. Uh, solve the following. 4x cubed minus 12x squared minus x plus 3 is equal to 0. Um, and as you can see, I haven't given a lot of room here, and I've provided the hint, which says always check to see if you can factor by grouping first. Well, uh, this looks like I certainly can factor by grouping because what I can put right here is I can say uh, 4x cubed minus 12x squared, and I'm going to put that in brackets, right? And then I'm going to put negative, and then I'll put x minus 3 is equal to 0. Remember, I'm looking for that common binomial factor here when I factor by grouping. I'm going to take out 4x squared. And that will leave me with x minus 3 minus bracket x minus 3 is equal to 0. Okay, so I found my common binomial factor. This is my common binomial factor. It's common to both terms. It's a binomial, and you can factor it out. So x minus 3. Uh, and then 4x squared minus 1 is equal to 0. Well, as we saw up here, I indicated in the rules we can um, look at um, further factoring, right? So we did factor by grouping. Um, this is actually a difference of squares right here. So um, 4x squared minus one, so now I have uh, x minus three, and then I have two x plus one, and two x minus one is equal to zero. Okay, again, by the zero product rule. One of these factors must be equal to zero to create an expression that equals zero, right? Because zero times anything equals zero. So that means that um, either x minus three is equal to zero, so that means x is equal to three, or uh, two x plus one is equal to zero, which means that x is equal to negative one half, or two x minus one is equal to zero, in which case x is equal to positive one half. So my values for x uh, that solve this polynomial equation is equal to three and plus or minus one half. I don't really like that minus sign, so I'm just gonna clean it up here. Plus or minus one half, there we go. Okay, moving down here. So example three, the height uh, in meters of a certain roller coaster above the ground, sorry, the height in meters of a certain roller coaster car above the ground can be modeled as a function of time in seconds. So this is a polynomial function, right? Because it's modeling the height as a function of the time where time is between zero and 30 seconds. How long is the car above a height of 24 meters, right? So what we're going to do is um, we're going to find uh, when the height, when the um, uh, the roller coaster car 
is above uh, or is at 24 meters. So what I'll do is I'll put, I'm gonna have to set h at t equal to 24 meters. Right, because I want to find the time when it hits that 24 meter mark. So then I resubstitute these values in, or I substitute h at t is equal to 24. So I put right here, uh, 24 is equal to negative 0 0.001 t to the power 4 plus 0 0.059 t to the power of 3 minus 1.19 t squared plus 9.4 T. Then I'm going to set one side equal to zero, so I bring everything over to the other side. Okay, now that I've set one side equal to zero, I have these um, like pretty hideous coefficients here, like negative uh, 0 0.001. So what I might do there is uh, I'm gonna divide everything by negative 0 0.001. So let's divide that by negative 0 0.001, uh, negative 0 0.001. Okay, and in doing so, that should clean up my polynomial equation a bit so that I'm not dealing with these uh, decimal values. So I get uh, zero is equal to t to the power of four, and then I'm gonna get minus 59t cubed plus uh, 1,190 t squared minus 9,400 T plus 24,000. All right, so right here I have a quartic. Um, I can't think of ways to factor this by uh, grouping. Um, so what I might do here is um, I might actually uh, do some like test values, right, to see if I can factor, uh, like use factor theorem here, right? So I'll insert, like for example, I look at uh, 24,000 and I think of, okay, what are some possible values there, uh, some possible factors of 24,000? Uh, well, it could be like one, two, uh, two plus four is six, so three is another possibility. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think four is another factor, and so is five. So I do some test values right there. Uh, notice that I'm choosing only the positive t values because I have a restriction on t over here. It's got to be greater than zero, but it's got to be less than 30. So eventually I come and I find that uh, when t is equal to five, this is equal to zero. So that means um, basically uh, I have t minus five is a factor. because when I set t is equal to five, this is equal to zero, right? And that's just through a little bit of guess and test, uh, inserting a bunch of values and uh, finding when it is equal to zero. So that's my k value right there, five, and then I set up my synthetic division. Um, so I get uh, one, negative 59, uh, 1,190, 9,400, and then uh, 2,400, I'm not sure. I don't need to put that positive value right there. Uh, 24,000 rather. Okay, so one comes down, then one times five is five, right? I add those two uh, and I get um, negative 54. And I multiply that by five and I get 920, or rather negative 920. I apologize, that's a mistake. Five times negative uh, 54 is negative 270. And then when I add those together, I get 920. And when I multiply that, I get 4600. 
Remember, I'm multiplying all of these by 5 using my synthetic division. Uh, and then I end up with negative uh, 4,800 when I subtract those two. Uh, and then when I multiply that by 5, well, I get 24,000. Rather, negative 24,000, which makes sense because my remainder is 0 because t minus 5 was a factor. So I just have to remember what this is, what this represents. Well, that's um, t cubed. That's t squared. That's t, okay. All right, and that does not have a t value, or rather it's basically like t to the power of zero. So zero is equal to uh, t minus five. And then I have right there, as I said, t cubed minus 54t squared uh, plus 920t minus 4800. All right. And I need to factor this uh, even further, okay? Um, and I uh, previously tried to see if I could factor this by grouping, but I couldn't find anything that uh, would work here. Um, so, uh, so I have to look at using um, my factor theorem again, right? So I look at this final value here. Uh, it's negative uh, 4,800, so I'm only going to look at positive values of t because that's what my restrictions were. And uh, eventually I find that t, when t is equal to 10, this becomes 0. So that means t minus 10 is a factor. It's a factor of this cubic right here. So uh, I'll set up 10. Again, another round of synthetic division. 1, negative 54, 920, negative 4,800. Okay, uh, bring this one down, multiply by 10, that's negative 44. Ooh, that was horrible, let me just rewrite that one. Negative 44, uh, then multiply that by 10, negative 440. Add these together, 480. Multiply by that by 10, and I get 4,800. Adding those together, I get zero, which is what I expected if t minus 10 was a factor. Okay, so almost done. t minus 5, t minus 10. And then I end up having uh, this right here, which is t squared minus 44t plus 480. Okay, so again, you could spend some time thinking about two numbers that multiply to um, 480 and then add to negative uh, 44. Um, and if you were to find those numbers, you would see that that is, okay, so that's uh, uh, t minus 5, t minus 10, okay, and then you'd have t minus 20 and t minus. 24 right and you can see this and that's 480 so or the 48 kind of is a little bit of a giveaway right because 48 is just 2 times 24 but because we have the 0 there so it's 20 times 24 and those two add to equal to negative 44 now say uh, you didn't want to uh, like spend some time thinking about that or that didn't come to you right away Remember that you can always just use your quadratic formula, which is t is equal to 44 plus or minus negative uh, 44 squared minus 4a in this case is 1, and c is equal to 480 all over 2a, which is just 2, and then you would find your two t values. So t is equal to, uh, sorry, t is equal to 20. and t is equal to 24. All right, so you could have done that as well and that would have worked. All right, so it looks like our um, car is at 24 meters, right? So the car is at 24 meters uh, height at five seconds, 10 seconds, uh, 20 seconds, and 24 seconds. But you have to think about this for a second, right? 
The question um, didn't ask for that. It says, how, for how long is the car above the height of 24 meters? Well, um, it's at 24 meters at 5 and 10. And so therefore it would stand to reason that um, the car is actually above this, above 24 meters for five seconds here, right? Um, and then between here and here, four seconds. And so altogether, nine seconds. Now, you might ask me, uh, you know, well, how did you know that it wasn't above on this case, on this interval between 10 to 20, right? How did you know it was above in this case right here? Well, if you look at the function, it is an even function, which means that it's going to be opening up or down, but because it has a negative coefficient there, uh, that means that it opens down, right? So um, opening down means that at five seconds, right? So it's gonna go up and hit 24 at five seconds, right? And then remember as an even function, so let's just, I'll sketch it out for you over here. Being an even function, um, it's gonna go up, right? Um, and it doesn't, we don't know necessarily, uh, we could look at where it starts if you set t is equal to zero, but we're not gonna really care about that for now. It goes up, Five seconds, it hits 24, then it comes down. 10 seconds, it hits 24, right? Then below 10 and 20, it's below 24, right? Then at 20, it's at 24, and then at 24, it's back down. And it has to do this, right? Because uh, as we see, as we saw before, this is an even function, it's a quartic, right? And it's opening down uh, because it has the negative coefficient, right? So at this point right here, right, we look here, and we look here, and we look here, and we look here. And so this different, this, uh, sorry, the difference between these points was five seconds, the difference between those points was four seconds. So it was above 24 meters for nine seconds. Now, we're gonna learn a, uh, a slightly different way of approaching this problem in the future uh, by using inequalities. But for now, um, you know, this is one way to take a look at it. Okay, if we take a look at this next one right here, state the zeros for the following function. So let's just quickly go through this. Um, right here, we can, uh, if I look at this, I mean, to me, there's some things that are screaming like this is factorable, right? So this x squared minus 27, and that has a three there, and there, that's divisible by three. And then I see a trinomial here, like a quadratic trinomial here. So uh, that means that I'm gonna probably be able to factor that too. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clean this up a little bit by um, uh, factoring out uh, a couple of things. So if I look at this first bracket here, I'm gonna factor out a two from that first bracket, and I get x squared minus two x plus one. And then from the second bracket here, I'm gonna factor out a three, and then I get uh, x squared minus nine. All right, uh, multiplying all the coefficients together, right? Uh, negative 2 times 2 times 3 is equal to negative 12. Negative 12 x squared, and then I have this right here. Okay, so recall uh, that in order to find the zeros, I set one side equal to 0. So 0 is equal to negative 12 x squared. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and factor that. Two numbers that multiply to give me one, add to negative two, well that's x minus one, and that's also x minus one as well. That's a perfect square trinomial. Uh, x squared minus nine uh, is equal to, that's difference of squares, x minus three, x plus three. Okay, so I can clean that up just a little bit. Uh, there we go, x minus one squared, uh, x minus three, x plus three. So now according to the zero sum, or sorry, not the zero sum rule, but the zero product rule, um, each of these factors here uh, could possibly be equal to zero. That could be equal to zero, this could be equal to zero, this could be equal to zero, right? So that means that my possibilities for x, well, x could be zero, and that would cause this entire equation to be zero. Uh, x could be one, and then x could be plus or minus three. So those are your values, and that was done quite quickly just through factoring, right? No need to expand, no need to, no need to expand and simplify, then start your factor theorem. That would just be a waste of time, okay? 
This next one is a little tricky. So uh, this one right here, we can't see anything um, being immediately factorable. So what I have to do is maybe I'll have to try this factor theorem. And I look at this last digit right there, and that's a one. So really, my only two options here, the two factors of one is just one. So let's try f at one and see if I get zero. Well, one to the power of four plus one to the power of three plus one. Well, we know that that's three and that is not equal to zero. So that means that x minus one is not a factor. Okay, and then over here we take a look at, um, well, let's try a negative one, right? Okay, well, that's negative one to the power of four plus negative one to the power of three plus one, and uh, we can see from that 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 is not going to be equal to zero. That's going to be equal to positive one. And so that's not equal to zero. So that means that x plus one is not a factor. Okay, so we can't factor this using factor theorem, right? Um, so we have to go to maybe looking at, uh, and I don't think we can do, um, uh, it doesn't look like we can do a factor by grouping here either. Um, so, uh, I think we're just going to have to take a look at this, um, you know, look look at this graphically. One thing to consider though, before we go and look at this graphically, we see this right here. This is, um, as we can see here, this is a, a quartic, right? So it's an even function or even degree function rather. That's what I meant to say, even degree function. It's a quartic, um, which means that it either opens up or it opens down. Um, but it's possible that this has no zeros because it could be uh, opening up above the x-axis. And I know it's opening up because the leading coefficient is positive one, right? So it's a positive value, so it's gotta be opening up. But the possibility here is that this is a quartic that uh, is above the x-axis, right? So let's, uh, let's do this graphically and then uh, we'll look at it algebraically as well to see uh, how we could have known algebraically that this was in fact uh, opening up above the x-axis. All right, so putting this into a graphing calculator like Desmos, we see pretty clearly that um, you know it's opening up above the x-axis, right? So we have no zeros here, um, so there is uh, no real number that uh, that x can be. So now I'd like to look at this graphically, or rather uh, algebraically, and see how we could have known this. Okay, so uh, we see right here that um, this right here, f of x is equal to x to the power of four plus x to the power of three plus one. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually just take a look at this first portion right here. Well, that's x, uh, and then that's uh, x cubed plus one. All right. This right here, if I was just looking at this function, this is a quartic function, right? This part right here. That's a quartic function, and that quartic function has zeros, right? Just this right here. So the zeros there um, would be uh, zero and negative one. Those would be my two zeros for this function, right? Negative one cubed is negative one plus one. That would be equal to zero and then x is equal to zero. So this cubic function has zeros, but then as we can see, it's been shifted up one, right? And the shifting up by one is you take something that has those zeros, shift it up by one, and it uh, no longer has uh, zeros. So um, this kind of could have been a clue. Well, you know, this is a cubic, rather this is a quartic function that's opening up. Um, Without that positive one, it has zeros, but it's been shifted up, so maybe it doesn't have those zeros anymore. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to erase this. You don't need to worry about that so much. Okay, so then we write right here, therefore, um, f of x has no zeros. All right, uh, and then finally we can use graphing software to plot these ones, right? So if you just, again, input this equation into Desmos, uh, you should be able to come up with the uh, three x values here that cross the x-axis, and your three um, 
x values are uh, negative 0 0.7. Okay, that's one of them. x2 is equal to exactly 0 0.8. And x3 is equal to approximately uh, 1.8. And so what we did there is uh, basically you put this into a graphing uh, software and then you look at the x-intercepts and here they are. And those are the roots of this uh, polynomial function. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for watching. Um, homework is listed right there. Uh, and have a good day.